is CGTN, China Global Television Network. From 1978, UNESCO has continued to list and honor the world's cultural and natural heritage. These sites are deemed to have outstanding universal value. So far, about 1,154 sites have made the list. From the Great Wall of China to Victoria Falls and the Great Barrier Reef, nearly half of the sites are in Europe and about a quarter are in Asia and the Pacific. But Africa only has 96 properties inscribed on the World Heritage List, representing just 9%. This is despite the unique histories, cultures and biodiversity found on the continent. This geographic imbalance in listing centers of heritage is nothing new. Experts have accused this awarding of sites to be Eurocentric. However, Africa faces several challenges itself, from a lack of structures to low political will to preserve cultural and natural heritage, the continent struggles to represent itself on the global stage. So this week on the program, we find out what is the cause of this imbalance and how the continent can better preserve its cultural and natural heritage and the importance of the World Heritage List for Africa. I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to the program. In 1972, UNESCO hosted the landmark World Heritage Convention. Experts came together with a mission to identify and protect the world's natural and cultural heritage. These sites were considered to be of outstanding universal value. Six years later, in 1978, the first 12 World Heritage sites were nominated. Three sites from Africa made the list. They included Ethiopia's Simien National Park and the rock-hewn churches in Lalibela and Senegal's Gori Island. Despite this strong start, Africa accounts for only 9% of the World Heritage List. Of the 1,154 total World Heritage Sites, there are currently just 96 properties inscribed on the World Heritage List. This include 53 cultural, 38 natural and 5 mixed properties. Currently, nearly half of the UNESCO World Heritage Sites are in Europe and about a quarter are in Asia and the Pacific. This year, more sites are being added from Africa. Eight mosques in northern Côte d'Ivoire and Yvondo National Park in Gabon made the list. In addition to the two sites in Africa, the responsible committee at its 44th session in Fuzhou, China, named 16 candidates from Europe and another 16 from other world regions as new World Heritage Sites. With such rich history and culture, Africa is seemingly underrepresented on this list. To find out why, I will be joined by a panel of experts. Well, let's broaden our discussion a little bit and bring in our guests today. Joining us from Paris, Dr. Mechild Rosler, Director of the UNESCO World Heritage Center, in Nairobi, Dr. George Abungu, Emeritus Director General of the National Museums of Kenya and a former uh, representative of the UNESCO World Heritage Committee. And in Johannesburg, Dr. Ndukuye Ndulovu, Manager, Archaeology at the South African National Parks and a former Senior Lecturer, Department of Anthropology and Archaeology at the University of Pretoria, all joining us via Zoom. Thank you very much for joining us on the program. Uh, program. Uh, Dr. Ross Live, I may start off with you because since uh, 1978, UNESCO has listed 1,154 sites as World Cultural and National Heritage Sites of Outstanding Universal Value. First of all, just give us a brief, what constitutes a heritage site? These are sites of outstanding universal value as defined by a legal instrument, which is the World Heritage Convention. So we have natural and cultural properties, and uh, it is actually the Intergovernmental World Heritage Committee, which includes sites on the World Heritage List. So they look whether the criteria which uh, we have, uh, which are 10 criteria, uh, six for cultural and four for natural uh, are fulfilled by these sites. And the last session we just had uh, online from Fuzhou in China in July this year. 
So um, when you talk about the cultural, the natural, and the mix, talk to us about the categories uh, that Africa stands out most with. Africa has um, a great diversity of sites, um, but you have to say that we have um, a greater percentage of natural sites from Africa. And these are the amazing places like the Ser Serengeti and Nongorongoro. But we have also a number of cultural sites like Asmara, which was inscribed um, a couple of years ago, or if you think of the great, uh, of greater Zimbabwe uh, in Zimbabwe, which is a fantastic uh, cultural site. All right, Dr. Abunga, I want to go to that uh, session in uh, China that uh, uh, Dr. Rosler mentioned because the 44th session of the World Heritage Committee this year nominated two sites in Africa as new World Heritage sites, but the committee named 16 candidates from Europe, another 16 from other world regions. What is your reaction to this and what is the criteria of designating or determining a cultural site? This is not something that is unique because this has been going on for a long time. And I think through UNESCO and through the states parties and also through the committee, this is an area that they have tried to address for many years. And one of the areas, one of the means of addressing it uh, was through what they call the global strategy, which was supposed to uh, create a more balanced representation between the different continents and the different uh, uh, parts of the world. Unfortunately, this has not been the case. Africa has lagged behind. Right. Uh, we have the majority of sites in danger list and uh, the minority in the list because of different reasons, which I believe we'll discuss. Right. But of course, it is something to worry about. And as we continue to discuss, I think some of the uh, issues that have led us to that will come out. I do want to get Dr. Rosler's reaction to uh, what you're talking about I in terms of that, uh, you know, Africa only received about uh, two sites, was well, nominated for two sites this year as opposed to the 16 for, for other countries. So perhaps Dr. Rosler can shed a bit more light on why uh, this was the case. Uh, Dr. Rosler. Yes, I think it, uh, it is really an important uh, discussion. Now, you need to know that in terms of the World Heritage Convention, Europe includes Europe and North America, which is 51 states parties, while the Africa region is 35 states parties. Every state party can nominate one site per year, uh, which is being reviewed by the World Heritage uh, uh, Committee. So the situation is that we have for Africa only 98 sites. Um, for the whole continent, if you count also Northern Africa, 139 sites. And that is uh, indeed, as uh, Mr. Abungu just said, uh, it is an issue for us. Um, one uh, of the reasons is that um, uh, the African countries ratified the convention late. But uh, let me just tell you, at this session of the World Heritage Committee, right. we presented the report on African uh, heritage, which is the periodic report. And this was uh, very, very well received, which provides some insights uh, of what the crux of the matter is, but also a way forward in terms of capacity building programs, in terms of conservation and management of the existing sites. But also what I find very important is education and working with uh, the young people and communication. Dr. Ndlovu, let me get your thoughts here or, or, on what you've heard. What do you, what's your view? On, on one side, you, you would uh, naturally say, you know, Africa is underrepresented, you know, uh, but then on the other side, uh, is it a game of numbers? You know, um, if Africa were to one day, you know, have the same number of sites as, as Europe, are we going to sit back and say we are now happy because we've played the number game? and uh, we have succeeded you know, in, in playing the number game. So I don't think it should always be about uh, the number game. You know, for me, there are much more other pertinent issues um, you know, um, in, in, in as far as um, the nomination uh, and, the, and the inscription, uh, inscription of um, World Heritage Site you know, is concerned. So I think there are other factors that we should be putting uh, a lot more of our attention to rather than the numbers game. I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, saying the numbers game is not important, but I think we are giving far too much attention to it than to the other factors. Dr. Abungu, 
let's address this uh, this issue that's been raised uh, by um, Dr. Ndlovu, that it shouldn't actually be about a numbers game. There are other pertinent issues to be discussed as opposed to um, ramping up Africa's numbers of 98. What are your thoughts? I, I, I think that, um, as uh, Dr. Ndlovu has mentioned, that it's not a question of numbers. Uh, but the issue is that there are parts of the world that are on the rush. Uh, if UNESCO and if the convention is for everybody, and if we are sharing a heritage of humanity, and some part of the world is on the move to the extent that when a new particular type of heritage is put across, they are always ahead. It, so, it shows the diversity uh, that is between us. If indeed we are sharing, then I think it has to be a question of numbers. It has also to be a question of how we conserve our heritage. Are we conserving our heritage properly? Because the numbers, why I'm saying that it may be a question of numbers, because Africa also has the largest number of sites in danger. So should we be out of this heritage classification? Why do we go there? And then we are listing, we are we are leading in, in in heritage which are in danger, but yet we are the least with the heritage which is listed, which is celebrated. This 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 is the issue. So as much as we do not want to compete in numbers, we would prefer that the little that we have is well conserved, so that we are not always seen to be on the two extremes, either the least in numbers on the list or the most in numbers of danger. So, 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 so this, this is the balance that we need to fight. Uh, in terms of, uh, of, of, of the listing of African heritage, I don't think that this is a competition. I mean, it, it has got nothing to do with competition, but I think the fair game demands that if we are sharing and we call it heritage of humanity, then Africa has to be able to put its resources or has to be assisted to have those resources to recognize heritage of humanity within Africa that would actually be beneficial to communities today and the, the, the future to come. Because what we know is that some of this heritage, if not listed, would actually, be, 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 would, would actually disappear. And, no. and we can see that because we are also in the, in the, in the in, in the process of developing. And some of the heritage of yesterday is no longer the heritage of today. So, so, Dr. so, so this is part of the protection and, uh, and conservation of Africa's jewel that we are talking about. That Dr. is the way I look at it. Dr. Rosler, how would you react to that though, in terms of uh, it does seem that Africa is on the uh, opposite ends of the pendulum, on the one side listed as uh, the continent with the most sites in danger, but on the other side, not really uh, in the, with the same number of heritage sites as, uh, as other continents. How would UNESCO react to that? Now, we have uh, quite a number of sites on the danger list uh, in the African region, uh, the natural sites in RDC, for example, or the sites in Mali, but for reasons you know, because these are in conflict areas. Um, we have the same actually in the Arab region with all sites in Syria listed on the danger list and a number of sites in Iraq. So um, we have faced similar issues in other regions as well. But I have to say at this session of the World Heritage Committee, to my greatest surprise, um, we had uh, a site from Europe listed on the danger list, a site from Europe delisted because they didn't do what the committee requested, which was Liverpool. And then we had one site from Africa taken off the danger list after um, great work uh, being done by the uh, ICCN in, uh, in RDC, it was Salonga National Park, and the support from UNESCO. And I worked with my Africa team um, a great deal. We have invested, and I checked the figures with them, 20 million US dollars on African heritage over the last five years. And I hope that we see results in terms of nominations. We have uh, really worked a lot with uh, 
uh, the African World Heritage Fund in right. terms of capacity building. But as I said, I think we need to have other actors there. We need to have young people uh, working also in the heritage field, and we need to have the universities to do the studies. I think one of the problems in Europe is that um, they have um, a great deal of stakeholders working on nominations, preparing the files, etc. And I think in Africa, we need to get our act together and work uh, more hand, hand in hand to get the nominations to the World Heritage List. Now, um, one other point is we have a high number of African countries in the World Heritage Committee. Right. It's also a point that you need to act and say, this side from Europe is not ready for listing. So there is also a point where you need at the committee itself take decisions, which are sometimes not easy to take. Dr. Ndlovu, do you feel that uh, Africa is ill-prepared when it comes to perhaps lobbying or, you know, finding uh, a proper way to, um, you know, put their listings to the attention of the committee? I mean, let's look at South Africa uh, as a perfect uh, case study. Um, South Africa was not part of the world uh, in the sense that uh, there was apartheid in, uh, in the country. And uh, yet, you know, uh, between 1999 and today, South Africa has managed to have, um, you know, uh, so many uh, world heritage sites, you know, nominated um, and uh, successfully listed. So what does that tell you? Um, I don't think it says, you know, um, there is a significant shortage of skill. There are many practitioners around the African continent that I know of, you know, one of them being the Honorable Professor Bongo uh, on this, uh, you know, platform. So I... I, I and, 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 and there have been projects, you know, like Africa 2009 and the efforts, you know, by African World Heritage Fund that have been forever training these, you know, um, various, you know, um, you know, participants. So my point is, you know, if there have been so many training platforms, you know, um, what has happened to the individuals who have been getting training? You know, in this particular, you know, um, you know, platforms, are they being given the opportunities to implement what they have learned? So, while I can understand the issue of skill shortages, but I think it only is only to a certain extent. You know, um, if we've got an African country that has succeeded, you know, um, to to list you know so many sites within such a short period of time. We, we will continue with that, uh, Dr. Ndulovo. But on that note, let's uh, first take a short break. And when we come back, we'll have more on the cause of this underrepresentation and more about solutions and what can be done to achieve a more fair representation for the continent. To stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back to Talk Africa. Let's continue our discussion. Still with me from Paris, Dr. Metchild Rosler, Director of the UNESCO World Heritage Center in Nairobi, Dr. George Abungu, Emeritus Director General, National Museums of Kenya, and also joining us from Johannesburg, Dr. Ndukuyake Ndulovu, Manager Archaeology at South African National Parks. Dr. Abungu, I want to pick up uh, on a point that was raised by um, uh, Dr. Ndlovu on the issue of a shortage of skills. Is there a basis in the assertion that ap Africa appears less on the list because it lacks uh, structures? Because as opposed to Europe, it doesn't have so many stakeholders involved in the preparation process. Your thoughts? In Africa, we live heritage. We breathe heritage. Culture and nature is one and the same thing. Uh, so we, the, the, the question of, uh, of, of, of who is doing what uh, doesn't arise. Uh, the question of capacity building. Some of us have been involved in this capacity building for the last 30 or 40 years. And as Dr. Glovo had raised it earlier, Africa 2009 was 11 years of training. Some of these people are site managers. Some of them have become running heritage professionals. So they are there. Uh, the question is, I think for me is, and, and, and let me just pick up a little bit of where uh, Dr. Rosler mentioned. 
when he mentioned the one site which has been uh, delisted, which is uh, Liverpool, and one put in the danger list as an achievement, I mean, uh, if that happened in Africa, it won't be an achievement. So I, I think that we should try to avoid sort of, you know, when it's in Africa, it's normal. When it's in Europe, it's celebrated. Uh, this, 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 this is wrong. Uh, the, the issue is that we have the capacity, but are the systems, are the governments, are the state parties going to invest in the same way like the European governments are investing? Do we have the resources to put in world heritage the same way that is being put in Germany, in Britain, and other places? So, Dr. Abu, do that is... Isn't that a question for uh, that you could be answering? Does Africa no, 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 put but in I'm, the I'm, same? I'm raising the, I'm raising, I'm raising the question because I am <laughs> saying that we are not able to do that. So we have to face the facts. When Germany can spend two million euros to develop a nomination dossier to list a site, in Africa we are expected to use thirty thousand US dollars to do the same thing. Will that be able to make it? So there must be something, something very wrong. We must, we must ask those questions that we are not investing. That is why you cannot expect to achieve where you don't invest. So, so I, I think that the question that is for humanity does not matter. There is a complete imbalance. And this imbalance has been there from colonial times to post-colonial times to now. So to some extent, it's like rubber stamping. I think there is a need to revisit the whole idea and to stop talking about capacity building and structures. These are things that we've done for a long time. Right. If we are really going to invest, then let us look at these things equally. Let us put resources equally and let us support the people whom we have trained to do this work in a proper way with the full support rather than, you know, we being sort of, you know, rubber stamping the process as it goes on. Dr. Rosler, I mean, how would you look at that, though? I mean, is there a sort of uh, bias in the process? Sh should, should it be um, a different process for the different regions? Because as Dr. Abungu uh, points out, uh, not the same capacity is put in the African process as is done in the European or, or South American process. Mm, I know George for a long time and I know his opinions. I uh, share some of them and some of them I don't um, because I have the results from the African periodic reporting and they bring forward a number of actions which they presented this year to the World Heritage Committee. And it's the African countries, it's the African site managers, and they wish to see uh, a strengthening the representativity of Africa on the World Heritage List, but they also wish to have more capacity building for the conservation of the existing sites and the promotion of the cultural and natural heritage uh, in Africa. So they have a very specific view and I'm listening uh, to them. Now, I agree on one point is that there is from some of the developed countries uh, in Europe and elsewhere, a rush on the World Heritage List. And they invest, uh, as George has said, they invest a lot of money into nominations. Now, I think that uh, the new process, which was just adopted by the World Heritage Committee, um, which um, looks into a preliminary assessment prior to uh, listing sites, is the right one. Because then we can see, is this really are these really sites which um, are of true outstanding universal value, and they can go ahead for the World Heritage Listing, or are these sites which are brought forward for other reasons, including political and other reasons? So I think that is one point which um, the World Heritage Committee looked at, and uh, that process, the process will change. Now, what is not possible is right. that you have a global convention and you have a different treatment for each of the regions of the world. I don't think this is correct. I think we need to redress the balance. We need to assist African states parties more with the nominations like we do through the African World Heritage Fund and through direct projects. I obtained lots of funds from Oman, from Japan, from right. China, from Flanders to help. And I think there needs to be also a Willingness. There are fantastic sites out there, but this is not the end of the story. This is the beginning of a great story for Africa.
Dr. Ndlovu, it does seem that one of the questions that, uh, that is being raised here is how much significance uh, does Africa actually put to the whole idea of having a site, uh, you know, recognized and listed? You know, when you look at uh, countries that were previously colonized um, and you want to equate them with countries that were the colonizers, you know, you're, you're not... Um, uh, balancing, you know, the scale appropriately there. So let's look at the case of uh, Africa, you know, for example. You've got uh, significant levels of poverty, uh, and yet these are countries that are extremely rich in natural resources. Uh, resources that are, uh, to some extent, you know, um, abused, you know, by those, you know, from the previously, um, you know, uh, uh, um, leaders of, 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 of colonialism. So here's the issue. <clears throat> When, when, when these African countries um, with so much poverty and so much inequality amongst the population, um, some of which is actually growing post you know, um, independence, do you tell me that those governments must spend significant amount of money right. that equals to what Germany is spending to inscribe a site in order to inscribe a particular site because they are playing a numbers game? I don't think so. But also, here's another critical point. Heritage tourism in Africa, as far as I'm concerned, is very weak. Unlike, you know, in your European countries, for example. I mean, I've been to, to, to Paris um, or, or France in general. I've been to some heritage sites that, for me, some of which are even world heritage sites. But for me, they are not worth the World Heritage status as defined, you know, by the World Heritage Convention, as far as I'm concerned. Right. They were there because they were listed in the early days. But you will see people flocking into them. You will see those sites making a lot of money, the same amount of money that in African countries would not be possible to make because heritage tourism domestically and internationally is just weak. Africa is generally seen as the wilderness. People come here to see the big five. Not to, to, they don't come here, you know, to climb, you know, Mapungubwe um, and 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 be told the story uh, of uh, any African civilization. I want to get yes. a final comment from all of you, and let me start off with you, uh, Dr. Rosler, because to accrue the benefits, because there are uh, so much that has been raised in this discussion regarding uh, the benefits, the representation, fair representation, to accrue the economic benefits and achieve a fair representation across you know, uh, the world heritage, what do you think needs to be done and better? I think there are a number of things which need to be done, um, and they were outlined actually by the African states parties themselves. Uh, they would like to see that uh, there is better and more effective management of the sites, as uh, George has also pointed out, and uh, that there is um, a better preparedness for nominations, and that um, people also see what can be the benefits, but also what can be the impact for communities of these nominations. And then uh, the part which uh, I think we should do really more together, including with the African World Heritage Fund, is on education and raising awareness and bringing the different stakeholders, the different communities uh, into the daily management of the World Heritage Sites. Dr. Abungu, very briefly, you have the final word. I also just want to stress the fact that I think communities are important, but I also think that we need to collectively think about world heritage as a, a, a something of humanity and the responsibility of all humanity. That is the spirit of that convention. And therefore, uh, Britain or America should not sit there or just or Spain or Italy just accumulating sites while Africa is not able to do that. It is also their responsibility to ensure that. But we cannot continue reading reports and getting reports of things like capacity building forever. And that's all we have time for on this edition of Talk Africa. A big thank you to our panel of experts. In Paris, Dr. Mathieu Rosler, Director of the UNESCO World Heritage Center. In Nairobi, Dr. George Abungu, former Kenya's representative to the UNESCO World Heritage Committee. And in Johannesburg, Dr. Ndukuyake Ndulovu, Manager Archaeology at South African National Parks. Remember, you can be a part of this conversation online through a Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. And do join us again next week for more on Talk Africa. I'm Beatrice Marshall. Until next time, goodbye.